how are we able to manage our eating fairly well through most of our evolution, seemingly? We seem to have come out of it okay to now to be in this spot where we're fighting this crazy uphill battle. Um, how how did we get here and what were some of those steps along the way that you you identify, you see when you look back in history? Yeah, um, I mean, some of it's... Um... Some of it's sort of interesting. I, I kind of want to, um, uh, <laughs> um, it, it's, it's hard. I, I don't know. I don't know if your audience has read Daniel Quinn's work. Um, he, uh, Daniel Quinn, um, in, he was a first time writer. Um, and he, there was a prize that was given out by Ted Turner for uh, an environmentalist book uh, that would change people's minds about the world. Uh, and to, to, up to today, it's actually the largest prize that's ever been given for a single piece of literature. Uh, and he, yeah, he was a first time writer. He wrote a book called Ishmael. Um, and it's a, about what civilization is. Um, and it's about what mother culture is. Um, and it's about this idea that um, this sort of mythology that we sort of created centered around ourselves. Um, and so I think it, when he, when we're looking at all of that stuff, we, we say, all right, well, civilization is this, right? It's, it's what, maybe 0.5%, 0.2% of the entire evolution of the human species. Right. Um, and yet we know practically nothing about what occurred before that, right? And so when we talk about human history, really, we're just talking about nothing. <laughs> we're talking about what we see around us. Um, and one of the mythologies around it is, is that idea there, right? We, we've created agriculture. Agriculture has created a world that we see in front of us that is pretty damn impressive, right? Um, it's pretty stunning um, what you see in front of you. Um, it was never really designed uh, with humans in mind. Um, you know, uh, one of the things I find kind of interesting about this move towards, um, uh, Belinda Fecky was talking about the blue zone diets. So if you listen to the episode before, she was saying um, how they extrapolated from these centenarians um, a diet that they are sort of pushing to uh, all of these different uh, associations and mayors all over the world to push people into this one idea that this diet is the diet of uh, least harm uh, and even the most healthy diet if you wanted to live to the ripe old age of you know 98. Um, and so one of the things I always found really interesting about that is they actually ignore all of the other parts of what makes that uh, society actually work, right? Um, right. So community and, you know, um, and care and, you know, it, nurturing and respecting elders, <laughs> like all of that stuff we can just disregard. We're never going to create right. an environment uh, within a city that actually like uh, utilizes all of these basic principles. So you don't work yourself to death. You don't kill yourself to make a, uh, you know, a paycheck or anything like that. We're just going to take the diet, the one small part of that, and then extrapolate and throw that to the rest of the world. Um, so for me, like the 99.8% uh, of our history, we lived within these semi-egalitarian um, hunter-gatherer tribes. Um, and so resources were shared. Um, you, you uh, gatherers uh, would probably bring in, um, on average, more calories uh, than hunters. Um, but you had these commingled groups that I, uh, that worked, and they worked because they existed for a very long time. They operated within their environment. Uh, agriculture was very different. Uh, agriculture, um, in essence, builds upon uh, the resources in this finite space utilizes and exhausts those resources and then finds a way to move on um, through conquest, conquest and colonialism to a new space. Um, and so throughout history, it's a, it, uh, our history, the history of civilization, we have cons consequently done that. Um, we, uh, uh, Yuval Hari actually talks about this. He said, uh, prior to the 20th century, uh, when you would get these sort of guaranteed famines, which would happen periodically, you'd lose about 15% of the population. Um, now it's less than 1%. And we still considered, we consider that enormous progress and we consider it 
uh, to be a failing of human society if even that 1% starves, right? Um, and we do, I mean, that, that's, a, that's an incredible amount of progress, but hunter-gatherers didn't traditionally starve unless there was a chaotic, like, you know, um, you know huge event uh, that would fund fundamentally upend their society. Um, they weren't starving communities. Um, it, it, was, it became incumbent upon civilization to define those societies as on the edge of starvation all the time. Nasty, brutish, and short their lives were. Um, and so if you think about it from that lens, it actually becomes a really interesting concept because you're like, all right, well, how do they live and how do we live? <laughs> and we can see that you can see extrapolated through all of our culture. Like, who do we consider our heroes? The, the technocrats, the Bill Gates of the world, the, the people who are the civil, civilizational equivalent of gods among us, right? Um, they they don't exist among us. They don't have to descend to our level. <laughs> they live in private jets and you know super yachts and all this other stuff. Uh, they are the civil the civilization equivalent of you know like this you know this sort of godlike factor, but it actually descends into our entire culture itself. We are the we are the the tribe that went and killed our god. Uh, the god of this sort of law of what nature is. Nature says you can you can no longer you cannot exist in environments where you deplete all of its resources. Uh, right. And we said, you know, we we pulled our finger to God and said we're going to do that. Uh, and so that required us building a civilization that hoarded food. Um, so Daniel Quinn actually talks about. It. He said there are really only two cultures that exist today. He said, you can look at all of the things, all of the celebrations, every difference in culture that we have nowadays. He said that there's one culture that doesn't hoard food and there's another culture that does, you know? Wow. And, and one of the things I find really interesting about that uh, is that as a civilization, we cannot coexist with the one that doesn't hoard food, <laughs> right? That's right? Like we've, every single time we've ever looked at that civilization, we said that they were wrong and that they were somehow a threat to ours. So even Benjamin Franklin talks about this. He said, you know, it, and this is anecdotal information from one of his, uh, some of his writings, but he said um, when he looked at Native American societies, he always looked at the, the Western societies, the people who ran away from the Western societies into those tribes. He said he'd never heard of somebody who did the exact opposite. Wow. <laughs> they, wouldn't, wow. You, they wouldn't want to do it, right? Yeah. Uh, and especially women. You think about how repressed and repressive ch childhood and, um, and, and women's idea of their own rights were uh, all the way up into the 20th century. Um, when they found an alternative, at, um, and it may have been barbaric by any uh, measure, that was used in the West, they always preferred that. Wow. Uh, Darwin talks about that in his biographies. Um, they actually stole a number of uh, South American tribesmen, brought them back to the West and educated them and put them in proper clothes. And they went to go and they went to uh, uh, deliver them back so that they could proselytize to their community, the benefits of civilization. And all they found left was their clothes. They'd immediately yeah. just, just discard all yeah. that and yeah. just left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad you brought that up. It's so interesting to look at that, and we do look back and and how agriculture started. And it, to me, it seems like the creation of a commodity is is kind of the the pinnacle or the linchpin that that where I don't know just the implications of the things that changed from from being egalitarian, from being a cooperative group of people. We're not going to take more than we need because why the hell would we? There's no purpose. We don't need a religion. We don't need a, 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 an army. We don't need land. All of these things are so foreign. But once you have a commodity, all these things start to develop. I mean, you mentioned the, the book Sapiens does a great job going into all this. And I, I think most people they're they're so entrenched in civilization they don't know that there could be anything even different mm -hmm. um yeah and and it's it's very difficult to kind of talk about that stuff because i think one um you know he, he uh daniel quinn will 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 make the analogy you know, like he uh what he's trying to do is is train people to be sort of martian anthropologists 
Uh, so you have you you've grown up in a, a culture completely devoid of of civilizational culture, and now you've come here and you start to look for the bullshit that our culture, in essence, kind of puts out into the world. Um, and so uh, one of the stories that he tells um, in in one of his other books was um, there was a sort of landmark event. Um, probably in the early 90s or late 80s, where we had reached a population of about six, six billion people. Uh, and somebody had said, um, well, that's not a really big deal because you could actually give one acre to every single one of those people um, and then put them into Texas. Like it's, it, you know, it's, it's actually fairly small. When you think about the globe, you could take 6 billion people and throw them into Texas and give them an acre of land and they would all live. And, um, and so it, it seems really profound, right? You're like, wow, that, uh, wow, you know, that's kind of amazing. But he said that um, the bullshit of that story is that you would still have to terraform the earth in order to feed those people, in order to give them water, to give them all of the basic needs that they require. Um, and that's what civilization is. It's a, we are dispersed throughout this planet but we have in essence terraformed this globe to feed ourselves. Um, and one of the bullshit sort of matrix uh, elements of a lot of this stuff uh, is that when you extrapolate that idea to the way that we talk about animal agriculture nowadays, you'll see these sort of one-off stories about Amazon deforestation for cattle production. Uh, and so you say, all right, well, you, you, we now have to limit or curtail um, beef consumption all over the world because of what is uh, under Jair Bolsonaro's government in Brazil, they are deforesting the Amazon. Um, and so you extrapolate this and you're like, what, what, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, we have, to, we have deforested all of Western Europe. We deforested huge tracts of Russia. 98% uh, of the, um, the old growth forests in the United States are gone, Canada as well. Every single part of the Western world has been deforested in many different ways. Um, we are deforesting huge tracts of Indonesia and Western Africa for palm oil production. Uh, you know, any number of different things that are displacing uh, indigenous tribes and doing, you know, in incalculable harm to uh, our entire ecosystem. But we're just going to focus on well, because when we flew a drone over the over Brazil, we saw some cattle on the ground. And so therefore cattle are the problem, <laughs> you know? And so, it, and, and I know it's really difficult, right? So like you go into, so uh, Brazil has, uh, it's really hard to like pull through all of the strings of what, what the cattle are doing there. Um, and when you see pictures of those cattle and you see them being exported to the rest of the world, you see what Brazil is trying to do, which is in essence, use agriculture as a means of uh, wealth um, accumulation so that they can compete in the world market uh, for the global North, right? And so the Brazilians would be like, fuck you, you know, like you have already done this, right? Like think of the slave trade, think about cotton, think about sugar production, think about all of the hundreds of years you've gotten a head start on on building this and now you say oh well we destroyed the planet so sorry guys <laughs> you can no yeah. longer do that um, but then you have to also dig into what is actually happening in the amazon so there is so they build these roads and the roads are to um hy uh, hydroelectric uh dams and so once the roads are built they essentially create these tracks uh along there that people can then go and annex land um and the land is built for, it's mined for um, aluminum, for bauxite, for aluminum production. It's mined for gold. It's mined for critical resources uh, that, you know, that, um, you know, for, for our global landscape of everything. Um, and then at the end of it, it's uh, deforested for um, cattle production. Uh, and then eventually it, it's moved into soy production. Uh, and so you're, in essence, sort of taking all that land. Uh, cattle end up becoming a placeholder so that you can lay claim to that land. Um, and we have seen this before through colonialism. It's part of the reason why the West was won, uh, is that you there was a notion called terra nullis, um, which meant that you could take land from indigenous tribes uh, because they weren't actually utilizing the land for production. Uh, they were farming the forest. 
They've been doing it for hundreds of generations, but not in the way that Western agriculture thought of it. And so if it was terra nullis, you can in essence sort of control and dominate that land because you're now setting it up for production. Production meant civilization. Um, and so you kind of get into this whole thing. It's like, they're just using Western ideas of colonialism um, and uh, to in essence sort of grab for these like large parts of tracks of uh, places in Brazil. But still like you can't blame the Brazilians for that because 5% of the country owns like 95% of the land. So this wow. is a legacy of colonialism as well. So you have this small percentage of people like the Davos people who are making billions off of the annexation and um, uh, the, the cultivation of all of this land. Cargill is in there, JBS is in there. Um, so you have this 1% of people um, who are utilizing and financializing all of this stuff. And then at the end of the day, you blame Brazilians for that. And I'm just like, come on, you know, like we need to have more nuance to this debate. Um, but what ends up happening is then it becomes like, if you eat beef, you're contributing to deforestation. I'm like, <laughs> you know? yeah. 